Galatians 5, and beginning in verse 16, Paul says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. So it's a pretty familiar passage that we all have uh, read and heard sermons on before. So I, I don't want to belabor and go into too much of the details. I just want to collect some thoughts as we have um, a, a limited time to speak this morning before communion. So, of course, to get into the context, we need to ask who's being talked about here and who has fleshly desires. Again, just a, a limited overview, but we're talking about the Galatians. Who are the Galatians? Well, they were a church on the brink of abandoning the true gospel and deserting God who called them by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, Paul tells us in chapter 1, verse 6. What was this gospel? It was a false gospel of legalism. Well, what, what gospel is the true gospel? Well, that's what Paul tells us in the first couple of chapters of Galatians. The gospel that Paul received directly from Christ and verified <clears throat> excuse me, by the apostles, chapter 111 uh, through chapter 2, verse 10. It's the gospel of justification by faith alone, not by the works of the law, chapter 2, 11 through 431. This is the gospel that came to Abraham by faith prior to circumcision, prior to the law, through a promise by God. This is the gospel of the Abrahamic covenant that was fulfilled in Christ, the seed of the Abrahamic covenant, who fulfilled the law, not through human fulfillment of the law. This is the gospel that made them, that is the Galatians, sons of God, descendants of Abraham, and heirs according to promise. This is the gospel that set them free from the yoke of slavery, chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. This is the gospel of the law of Christ, the law of love, chapter 5, 7 through 15. So Paul tells us what this gospel is, and he tells them, you're following a different gospel that is really not another gospel. There is no other gospel. So why would they abandon the true gospel? Well, there's a fleshly appeal to structure and laws and human achievement. And the Judaizers were offering it up all and sugarcoating it. A completely different gospel that is not another gospel at all. Even Peter started to fall for this and Paul had to rebuke him. Look at chapter 2, verses 11 through 25 when you get a chance. We won't take a moment now. But Paul even had to discuss this directly with Peter and tell him, hey, you better stop what you're doing here. You're, you're compromising the true gospel. That is, do this, fill in the blank, and you will be holy, righteous, and saved. And, and there's a lot of blanks that we can fill in there, right? Man just doesn't know what to do with true freedom. That is, the freedom to love God and love his neighbor without bounds or limitations, that is led by the Spirit and manifested by the fruit of the Spirit. You ever seen a law on love? Anybody seen a restriction on joy? Anybody seen a limitation on peace? There's no limits on this kind of Spirit-led freedom. There's none. Which begs the question, 
What is our relationship with God like? Do we truly love Him, or have we fallen into a ritualistic set of rules that help us justify a relationship? Check those check boxes, right? We're all good at that. Go to church, read your Bible, check. Pray before meals, check. Listen to Caleb or the fish, check. Like a Facebook verse of the day meme, check. Don't do this, check. Don't do that, check. We love those check boxes. Do we have a list that proves, quote unquote, that that makes us a believer? Or is our motivation for doing anything and everything in the Christian life all because of our love for God and our relationship with Him? Do we have a love for Him and a hatred for sin that motivates us to do everything and anything that we do? So see how easy it is to fall for another gospel? Just start checking those boxes. Even if it isn't a legalistic salvation, but a legalistic sanctification, we can still fall prey to a hollow set of rules that appear to follow God instead of a deep abiding relationship with God. So, what are the deeds of the flesh that we can fall prey to when we're not walking by the Spirit? We read them, but let's go through them again. And we won't go into any definitions. Again, we're for the sake of time, but just to read the list off to familiarize ourselves with them. Immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. This is not an exhaustive list. So if you're thinking you got through the first six or seven or something like that, and you're like, oh, I'm good, I'm good. I can check that box, right? It gets harder as the list goes on. And this is not exhaustive. Paul had already forewarned them before, and he's warning them again about things that they're doing. And Paul gives other lists in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10, Ephesians 5, 5, Colossians 3, 5. You can also look over to Mark 7, 20 to 23. There's a number of lists that are like these, that are the deeds of the flesh that manifest. Paul even warns them that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. There's no room for legalism in the kingdom. So think about it. We have laws against almost all these things that are in this list. So do you see the inherent danger in a gospel of human achievement? Don't do these things and you're saved, right? Then you fulfill the laws, even human laws. Legalism, you check the boxes. But simply doing that is devoid of a, of a relationship with God. And there's no salvation in that. It's all of the flesh. There's no confession or repentance of sin or a need for a Savior. Just get by checking boxes. So what's the danger of doing the deeds of the flesh? Paul tells us in five, chapter 5, verse 17, For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. So what we see in the English there, sets its desire, is one word in the Greek, epithume, epithumeo, and it's to set the heart upon or to long for something. It's a desire. It's to covet or to lust in a wrongful sense, but it can be used in a rightful sense as well. Like we long for the coming of the Lord. There's a longing that is a righteous longing. There's a longing or a lust or a coveting that is a, an unrighteous longing as well. There's a number of different passages that cover it both ways. The word can be used interchangeably in, in terms of righteously or otherwise. And so the flesh sets its desire, it longs to do against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And they are in opposition. What's that word? anti kime uh, That is to be set over or against or opposite to, to oppose, to be adverse to, or to withstand so the point is, you simply can't be walking by the Spirit while performing a deed of the flesh. It's impossible. Their focus is entirely different. Their desires are completely different. The two are not simply opposites, but they are in opposition to one another. Think of magnets, and as much as you try to put the two poles of equal kind together, they're going to repel each other. 
They were adverse to one another. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh is antithetical to walking in the Spirit. But, one of the best words in all of Scripture, because it gives us hope, right? If you are led by the Spirit, Paul tells us in verse 18, you are not under the law. So the remedy, be led by the Spirit. Does that sound familiar? Romans 7, I do the thing I don't want to do. I don't do the thing that I want to do. We don't have the time this morning, but I encourage you to read Romans 7, 14 through 8, 17. It deals completely with this idea of struggling with the flesh and living in the Spirit. So how do we not do the deeds of the flesh? Well, this is not an exhaustive list either. Be filled with the Spirit. Ephesians 5, we're familiar with that. Speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, being subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Steve will get to the full explanation of that next year. But <laughs> Ephesians 5, right? So be filled with the Spirit. Be led by the Spirit. That's what's covered here in Galatians 5. Uh, we, we often, in conservative uh, evangelical circles, wonder a lot of times, what is the role of the Holy Spirit? And we don't always cover it that much. Well, part of His work is to convict the world concern, concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, and to point them to Jesus Christ as the one and only Savior. Another part is that He regenerates a believer. He guides and sanctifies believers in the truth of the Scripture. So be led by the Spirit. That is... Be convicted by Him when you have sin. Read the Word of God, and the Spirit will illuminate the Word to you. Yield to the Spirit and not to the flesh. Crucify the flesh is another way that you can not do the deeds of the flesh. Galatians 5.24, Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. That is, don't feed them. Don't feed the flesh. Starve it. Romans 6 talks about this. Shall we continue in sin that grace should abound? God forbid. How are we who are dead to sin continue to live any longer therein? Romans 13, 14 as well. Don't feed the flesh. Crucify the flesh. You can also cultivate your love for Christ and His holiness. We can look at Philippians 3. For that and Paul's desire to know Christ. How about Colossians 3? Set your mind on things above. And Ephesians 1, remembering your position in Christ that Steve has been preaching through. We have an incredible position in Christ from before the foundation of the earth. Remember your freedom that Christ gave you, Galatians 5.1. Keep standing firm and don't be subject again to a yoke of slavery. You came out of that. Why would you go back? Don't subject yourselves to the slavery. Remember, too, as well, that legalism has no benefit in Christ. Paul tells them in uh, Galatians 5.2, Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. Also remember you were bought with a price, and therefore glorify God with your body, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Accountability is also a good way to put the deeds of the flesh to rest. We, we looked at Galatians 2 already, right? Paul rebuked Peter. There's some accountability, even Peter. Not to mention Paul correcting all the different churches, especially Corinth. There's some accountability. Accountability is a great thing. How about communion itself? We're going to be taking it here in a couple of minutes. 1 Corinthians 11 reminds us, For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. Taking communion regularly is also a good deterrent to the deeds of the flesh. Romans 7, that we talked about, doing the thing that we don't want to do and don't, not doing the thing we want to do, understand the power and deceitfulness of sin. 
It's nothing to mess around with. It's nothing to play with. If you recall the last message that I preached from James, do not be deceived. Don't be deceived by sin. Don't. Recognize, resist, and flee temptation. Again, we talked about that last time in James and also 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There is a way of escape that God provides in every temptation. But I'm going to warn you, as Paul even warned the Galatians here, even these can become checkboxes if they're not a genuine relationship with God. If it's not motivated by a love for God and not being led by the Spirit of God, it's easy to run through all these and check, 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 and be devoid of a relationship. So what is this freedom we are called to look like? Well, like the fruit of the Spirit, right? The Spirit produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Again, we're all familiar with that, so I don't want to belabor the definitions and everything. But Paul says, against such things there is no law. Did you catch that? You can do these to the maximum every day, 24-7. No one is stopping you on putting a limit on the amount of love you can have. Sorry, you've reached your limit for love for the day. You can't love anymore. There's no limit. There is no limit on any of the fruit of the Spirit. Oh, that we know how to live like this. There's no limit on gentleness. There's no limit on goodness, the amount of goodness that you can do in a day. There's no limit on the kindness that you give. No limit on self-control. Think about that and go through that list again. There is no limit on any of that. So that's what we should be manifesting to the fullest. Because that's what the Spirit does. If we live by the Spirit, Paul says, let us also walk by the Spirit. Salvation and sanctification should all be by the Spirit and never the flesh. So let us yield to his leading and manifest true love, which reflects the love of God. Let's pray. Lord, as we think about these things heading into communion and the table and being reminded of your sacrifice, what was it for? You want your bride to be spotless and holy. And you want your spirit to work in the hearts of believers to purify and to sanctify them. So Lord, we pray that you deliver us from sin, from the desires and the deeds of the flesh. We pray that you strengthen us to walk by your spirit and to be led by the spirit to manifest the fruit of the spirit. Pray, Lord, that you... Remind us of these things, as your Spirit does, to call them to our mind, to constantly think about it, to meditate on it, and to be changed. Lord, help, help us make sure that the reason that we're doing anything and everything is because of our love for you, because of what you've done for us. And everything that works outward from a pure heart at that point will be done for the right reason, Lord. Forgive us for our failures. We thank you that the blood of Christ does forgive us. We thank you that you love us. We thank you that you're patient with us. In Christ's name, amen.